Welcome back to the coverage of YCIS London 2018. It is crunch time, it's round number 11 and we have two players who are on an X2 record. That means if they win, they are in. They are in the top 32. If they lose, all of that hard work yesterday and this morning was for nothing. That's at least how some people will see it. I won't see it that way. But um, we're going to leave you guys to that. You, you're going to have your own opinion about this. We did a short discussion in the chat what guys um, and what decks you would like to see. And one of those guys won. So let's bring him up in the red corner. It's Thomas Rose. Tom Rose from the UK. Hi, Tom. How are you doing? I'm excited. I'm nervous. I'm looking forward to playing some cards. All right. Uh, how familiar are you with the feature match? I mean, people know you, but mostly from sitting over there. Uh, well, I've, I think I've been on this table about as much as I've been on that one, Ooh. so I've seen both sides of it. It's always really good fun to be here, whatever you're doing. I've got my Millennium socks on me today, good job, so yes. I've, got, I've got luck, I can see the heart of the cards, you know. Right. It's you, still going to be fine. You don't seem too nervous, you seem to be really excited about this one. Yeah, I'm, I'm hiding all that under this facade, but Ooh. there are nerves. All right, all right. Tom is feeling good. Please have a seat. Thank you. Um, his opponent is a former World Championship competitor. We got Michael Fauna in the blue corner. How are you feeling? I'm feeling really good. I really like my deck. And I, um, yeah, it's good to you give a day, so I enjoy playing this game, so that's fun. You got a real poker face going on. Are you excited about this match or are you nervous? What's happening in your head? I really don't like feature matches, to go on feature matches, but I am. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to play because, it's, of course, it's a bubble, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a card game, it's my hobby, so right. I enjoy playing, I'm not that nervous. All right. Well, please have a seat. Thank you very much, guys. Best of luck to both of you. Um, we still have to conduct the die roll, please. Yeah, you can both take a shot. Oh, Thomas is going with two dice here. And we got <laughs> three. Okay, that's pretty hard to beat. Yeah, 11. All right. Michael gets to choose who wants to go first. Do you want to go first, Michael? You go first. All right. Michael Fauna is going to go first. The stage has been set. Let's take you guys over to our Yu-Gi-Oh! navigational system, Dom Tom. Hello and welcome back to round 11. Yes, we're going to help you navigate your way through this match. <laughs> We, we have a lot of experience at the feature match table today, Tom. We do, yes. We've got Tom Rose, who's won a YCS. He's won the UK National Championships. Michael Fauna, who's topped multiple YCSs, topped European Championships, notably came second in 2017. Went to the World Championship. Went to the World Championships. So there's a lot of experience sitting at that there feature match table. There is a lot of stuff table. going on, yeah. So if, we, yeah. If, if we think about their uh, deck types, we see that Thomas is playing the Burning Abyss as the crowd, the fans out there I were think asking. Every, everyone knows. Yep, they, by they were now asking for the. Tom the plays um, Burning Abyss. And they were asking for it, so we delivered it. And they, then we see Michael's playing the Danger Dark World. Danger Dark World, FTK, indeed. What are we saying about this matchup, Tom? Who's, who's, got, who's got the upper hand here? Anyone? If I'm going to be honest, the, the Danger Dark World FTK is quite quite ignorant of whatever it's playing against going first because the opponent doesn't really get a turn. Okay. So really you just want to be playing a deck where your opponent is not running that many hand traps. Although... Oh, we've just been informed that actually Michael is playing Dark Warriors, not Danger Dark World. So does that change the position here? Does, does, to does Tom now have a slight advantage? I'm just going to have to have a little look at his deck list to see whether his... You use is capable of FTKing the opponent or not. So, so you whether are that navigating. cannon soldier is, I'm I'm navigating. Doesn't look like it. It looks like he's going for a more sort of hand loop version. He's got three copies of Neo Space and Aqua Dolphin, which has seen less play than it used to. But in combination with Gumblar, it's actually capable of ripping the opponent's entire hand on the first turn. Which you is were talking cool. to me about this yesterday, weren't you? You you said to me that there's a there's a deck that can take away like six cards. Oh, that was the Mermel. So I mean, Gumblar is capable of taking out four. So if you add that to a Mulan Glacier, then you can get to six. Wow. Neospace and Aquadolphin can also do that because you can use it once and then add it back to your hand again with Firewall and then summon it again and then do it again. So you, there were some slight differences to what we thought about um, Michael's deck, but... Does this change pretty much how the matchup would be played? I Is there someone... Yeah, I mean, relying on discarding the hand of the Burning Abyss deck doesn't actually work so well as against other decks because they have a lot of effects which activate in the graveyard. Sure. So if you discard a Skarm or a Farfa or a Fiendish Rhino Warrior, 
then they can use that effect. Uh, they can use the effect of that monster in the graveyard. Search tour guide, banish money on monsters. So it might potentially interrupt what Michael is trying to do. And there did seem to be some nerves up there. Thomas, evidently nervous, or even though he's very familiar with the setup. Exactly. And Michael trying to hold it back, as Ollie said, with that little bit of poker face. How much does, when you're playing on the bubble, Tom, is, have you experienced that sort of nerve kicking in? Because it is always that nervy playing on the bubble, yeah. Uh, honestly, I found myself, I felt more comfortable in feature matches on the bubble. Probably just from some superstition, but uh, I always won the feature match. I've had like three or four feature matches on the bubble, all of which I've won. So <laughs> when I did it, I just kind but of it's felt coming happier. Down, but it's coming down to this for these guys. We know yes, that they both they both need to win this match in order to proceed to the top cut. Exactly. So, there's a lot going on right now. They know they can't afford to make any small mistakes or anything of the sorts because it could hold them back. I'm not sure if we're ready to, uh, to go are. to the table. I think we are. So without further ado, this is the final round of Swiss. I'll take you over to the match table for your round 11. So yes, they're just loading in those hands for us. So the key thing we're looking for in Tom's hand really is whether he can interrupt what Michael is trying to do because the oh we're going to have a look at the the tablet to see what's in Tom's hand and there isn't anything to interrupt some potentially large plays from Michael with the exception of Farfa which might get discarded so that's really not what Tom is looking to see he wants cards to interrupt his opponent although having said that I'm not actually sure he's playing any let's have a look yeah, so he's running the Kaijus, but he's not actually running anything that will be classed as a hand trap that I can see. So he's probably going to be a little bit nervous to see such an explosive deck. So it is a choice that players make as to whether they want to run these hand traps and just say, I, you know, if you run hand traps, they're cards which aren't part of your engine. They're not going to help you, uh, you know, attack your opponent. They're not going to help you assemble resources. So... Some players elect not to run the hand traps and just say, if your opponent's going to do something, I'd rather just have more cards to come back at them. Uh, but it's, it's a bold decision yep. because it means that you allow your opponent to do whatever they want on their turn, uh, yep. or especially on their first turn. And I guess that, that brings so much confidence to, to a player if they know that. I mean, and Michael's wasting and no time. He's got two Against the deck like Michael's. Yeah, it's really kick-started straight away with the... Uh, Summon a monk summoning a copy of the Armageddon Knight. We're going to see an absolutely massive turn yeah. from Michael, yeah. Straight away, the Malicious being banished, no hesitation, summoning in the additional copy from the deck, now Link summoning into his old. We're going to see one of the coolest interactions, um, which we don't see so much, is the interaction between uh, Summon a monk and uh, Divine Sword Phoenix Blade. So, Because okay. Summon a monk is a card which you discard a spell to summon any uh, level 4 monster from your deck. And then with the Phoenix Blade, that actually gives you like infinite food for the Summoner Monk yep. because you can just keep adding it back and discarding again. Obviously, each Summoner Monk is only once per turn, but with Firewall, you might be able to get around that by adding mo you know, so adding back the Summoner Monk to your hand, summoning it again, using it again, using it again. So it's quite a nice cycle there. It's a very cool... It's a one of the combinations of cards which I particularly enjoyed playing with. Yeah. And is that Axe of Fools? That is Axe of Fools. So players have be become a little bit more creative with what equip spells they're putting in their deck to fuel the effect of results. So you kind of basically have to find the, the best ones that you can. And there we see that Neospatian Neo coming down as Indeed. well. Indeed. So that, that's a really strong card, Neospatian Aquadolphin. Um, so is Michael feeling super confident right now? Is he I starting to build this momentum? He, he knows. He's feeling super confident, yeah. Is he, has he read between the lines? Tom would have stopped him by now, maybe, if he had a hand trap. Yeah, I mean, the dolphin lets you see your opponent's hand now. So unless this gets responded to, then, uh, you know, he knows now what he's playing against. He can yep. start to pick apart the cards in Tom's hand. Although there aren't actually that many good cards to hit with the dolphin. Okay. Because he doesn't want to hit the Farfa, because Farfa's going to banish one of his cards. He doesn't ideally want to hit the Jackalope, because the Jackalope's going to get to summon a danger monster from the deck. Barbar's got too many attack points to hit, so that only leaves the Libic that he can sort of usefully discard. But he might choose to discard the Jackalope anyway, because he might be able to discard both of them, and that's fine. Okay. So let's see. He's looking to continue this uh, setup here. This field presence is oh yeah, beginning this, to. This look first turn is going to take about 10 minutes, and it's probably going to end with Tom not having any cards left. Wow. So it's pretty. Uh pretty much a long process here in order to establish himself, Michael. Yeah, he's also got the Soul Charge, which is definitely a card that he's going to be happy 
happy to see. So I'm not, I'm not exactly sure where his next plays are, but the soul charge can make your deck uh, play slightly differently. Oh, Ooh, we the new Phantom Knights card. We've not seen that yet. Let's bring it up. It's a very, very cool card. I'm surprised that Tom's not seen it before. If I'm going to be totally honest. Maybe uh, he's just checking as to what it does. Maybe he's just double checking yeah. because I've kind of seen it. I know what it does, but because it'll probably be the first time someone have played it against me in a tournament, maybe. So it lets you send a Phantom Knight monster from your deck to the graveyard to uh, send uh, set a Phantom Knight trap card. So that effectively just gets you two monsters, which is pretty nuts because you can get the Phantom Knight trap. You can get the Phantom Knights with Shade Brigadine, which you can just set and play again. And the Phantom Knight monster you can then use the effect of in the graveyard to search the Phantom Knights Asylum boots. So now he's got. Pre it gets you two monsters. Sounds pretty impressive to me. It is pretty impressive. I mean, it requires a big Phantom Knights package, which is possibly why it's not so popular. And we see Michael summoning a bigger monster. So now he's going to have the choice of whatever he wants to discard with that Aqua Dolphin. So the, there is a restriction on the Phantom Knights of Rusty Bardish, as it's called, I think, which is that it cannot be used as a link material. Oh, so Michael's done well to put it there. I think it is a it's a good restriction because otherwise the card would be pretty insane. Uh, you could use it like multiple times. Um, you know, you could use it like to use it, get two more monsters, and then link it away seems pretty unreasonable. So as is now, it just sits there by itself, and that's kind of that seems fair enough so to me. Looking at the way the match is going, you you were tell you were telling me that this is going to be a long turn for Michael. What's going through Thomas's head? He He's probably aware that Michael is really familiar with the Burning Abyss anyway, because yeah. Michael used Burning Abyss for some time, if I remember. He did, so that is correct. what's going through Thomas's mind, knowing that he doesn't really have any interaction? Um, I think he's probably quite worried here, because his whole hand... He, he's in danger of losing a lot of his hand and staring down a very, very threatening board. Okay, and, uh, and you're pretty sure there's nothing... There's, um, Nothing he can do. Is he plotting at this point in terms of drawing additional cards from the deck or anything like this? So I mean, let's he, look at his deck. He list. might be what? thinking about his sixth card. I mean, the best sixth card for him is almost definitely Sekers Light. Yeah, because Sekers Light just gets you two more cards. Yes. Um, and other that'll than get him that, right back in the game. Maybe he might need a Kaiju to deal with whatever board that Michael sets up, but he might not have any cards to sort of push with anyway. So. All in all, yeah, I think we're just going to have to sort of wait and see how Michael ends up this turn. So he has got the Soul Charge, which does lead into a pretty massive turn one. Um, and that Levier, I remember that seeing a real lot of play. Um, it was one of the best XYZ monsters early on in Yu-Gi-Oh! Yeah, I'd you say. could detach a material to summon one of your banished level four or lower. Yep, that is what he did. So you can banish the Armageddon Knight with your copy of uh, Divine Sword and then summon it back. With the Levier? With the Levier, which is a very nice thing to do. Seems like summoning really Armageddon Knight is something that decks like to do nowadays. Yeah, really resourceful way of getting that additional um, send for Armageddon Knight as well. Yeah, I mean, keep reusing Armageddon Knight is something a lot of decks like to do. So he's making a uh, level And it looks really cool, seven. His deck, is his handwriting is awful. I don't want to be too rude, but his handwriting is truly awful. Okay. Um, and I can't read all of the cards. What are we looking at here? <laughs> uh, I'm just interested to see what uh, like level 7 he's going to make. And in fact, we're seeing Power Tool Dragon, which is a sort of OG synchro monster. From very popular card from back in the 5Ds era. Yeah, I don't remember it seeing actually that much play. I, I seem to remember the Supervised deck seeing some play. That was pretty cool, yeah. yeah. You could search Supervise. If you reveal, I think it does it at random, doesn't it? The equip spell. I'm not hundred percent sure, but I mean, otherwise Tom, I think, would have just put his hand on the overdone burial yeah, basically sure. immediately. So he is rolling a dice to pick. So unless he's being quite frivolous and randomly deciding <laughs> what card, I think he's uh, he is. So Michael's really building choose. this board, like you said. He's really starting to establish pieces here. I mean, he's still. This is all. All he's done all of this without using soul charge. And I mean, he's. So I think Tom's probably aware. <laughs> he's probably guessing that the soul charge is going to come down at some point. And there's five cards in his hand, Tom. So he's got lots more still to do, as you were saying. Oh yeah, and again, one of them is soul charge, which summons another whole board. Uh, pretty he's, impressive he's, he's, stuff. He got I think he's got six now. <laughs> um. Summoning this Armageddon Knight once again. <laughs> Maybe we should have an Armageddon Knight counter as how many times can you summon Armageddon Knight in the same turn? It's almost like the... Would it be a challenge? 
a challenge, yeah. To he see who get... could summon Armageddon like, the most times in one duel. Exactly. I mean, he can. what he can do now is bounce the DDR, which he just used to summon the Armageddon Knight for Zephyros. So he's going to return that to hand. And return it to hand, and then banish the Armageddon Knight again for the Phoenix Blade, and then activate the DDR and discard the Phoenix Blade and summon the Armageddon Knight again. I don't know what more targets he's got in his deck. He's got Plague Spreader Zombie. Uh, Great tune, an Armageddon Knight. Classic card. Um, Plague Spreader Zombie was uh, very popular back with the um, um, Dark... What was that uh, Synchro Monster, Tom? Level 6 um, Zombie oh. Monster. Dark Ruler version of Hard the Des. Zombies. Yeah. Yes, they had, a, they had a Synchro version of that. That's Plague Spreader was really good back then. Uh, does that look like a Link 4 to you? It looks like a Link 4 to me. So it's either Firewall or maybe a Saiyuja. Oh, it's a Gumbla. So oh, is he going yeah. for the cards in hand at this point? He is. I mean, he needs to be careful here because he knows that Tom's got a Farfa in his hand. Uh, and he, he knows about the two Danger Monsters uh, Yeah, as well. so I don't think Tom's going to be overly upset about the prospect of discarding cards from his hand, which, as I said, does give him a, a slightly nicer matchup against decks which intend to do that. Because if he discards, he can discard the Farfa and that will banish a card. Yep from Michael's board. But I think Michael is more than capable of playing around that capability. Here we see, so that here we see the DDR. DDR again, as you said. DDRs might summon instead the Aqua Dolphin, but it might just summon the Armageddon Knight one more time. <laughs> ah, so he summoned the Aqua Dolphin, yeah. So he does look to be wanting to take away um, cards from Tom's hand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> really He's having a lot of fun. Uh, Tom may be just checking that it has to be in attack mode. I didn't know whether it had to be in attack mode or not. I'm not sure anyone's really been that bothered about activating DDR or whether it has to go in attack mode. It's only going to get linked away anyway, so... Um. I've always liked the dimensional cards, Tom. DDR I, is a very cool card. I used to love playing the um, DD Survivor deck. I'm interested he's activating the Soul Charge now. As opposed to later. I, like, I quite like... Getting lots of link materials in my graveyard for Soul Charge. And only for two. I mean, I suppose he has actually paid 4,000 life points with his Destrudo. <laughs> so. Um, I mean, I guess Michael knows what he's doing with the deck. He's played it a lot. Uh, he's played it for at least six rounds. <laughs> so here he's going to be hoping probably to discard the Sword. Uh, sword is always the one you want to discard with Gumblar. Honestly, like... He, Tom can choose what he discards, so Tom's definitely going to get to discard the Farfa, um, no matter what his role, you know. So, so and then what is he hit here? He, Let's have a look. Neither of them are swords. It's Greffa and. I mean, I think. Oh, it's the Phantom Knight. Tom is Ragged not going to have enough stuff, but he's going to get to. He's going to get to like trigger two of his Burning Abyss monster effects. Or, so he could either discard Libic or Jackalope, uh, Libic or Farfa. So we see the one straight away, there's one being sent away. Yeah. So Jackalope can now chew, uh, Farfa can banish any one monster. So I guess the, his, his, his thinking is probably either the Summoner Monk or the Aqua Dolphin. And this is all still Michael's first turn. Yeah, yeah. And it's <laughs> quite a way in at the moment. But funnily enough, Michael is actually now, he's, he's almost lost all of his life points. It's quite impressive that, isn't it? He started on, on... On your turn one. He's on his own turn one, he paid 4,000 for Destrudo and then 2,000 for Soul Charge. And Tom summons that copy of Danger. Um, how do you say that? How do you I'm say gonna that? I'm going to say Tsuchinoko. I'm going to go with your pronunciation. But I don't actually know. So yeah, so he's still got the Summoner Monk uh, and the Sword to use. And as we can see, Michael's got so many cards in his graveyard. I'm already. interested that we, we've not actually seen a Firewall Dragon come down from Michael. And Is he building towards that? There's still plenty of... Um, I can't actually see a Firewall Dragon in his extra deck. Which, if I'm honest, does surprise me. Because I think Firewall Dragon's pretty good. We saw somebody else not playing a copy of Firewall, didn't we? I'm not sure which feature match it was, but in one of our previous feature matches, we saw somebody else not um, playing a copy of File. I'm not sure who that was, though. Is it is it an almost a staple card? Is it a go-to? Well, in, in a sort of deck which is doing combos like this, you would I say would that you have to have yeah. it. So I assume he's just going to flip that Dweller in the standby phase, but 
If he doesn't, then Tom's going to get to use his Kaiju. So now, a nice. one of the things about Gumblar is it's a mandatory trigger. So... So Tom, what did we see just happen there, So Tom? Kaiju went over the Dweller, and I think Michael might be a bit irritated with himself for not just flicking the Dweller, because I'm not really sure... I'm not really sure there was any reason to hold it, and it played around the possibility that Tom drew the Kaiju. Um, we see a second copy of that. Which he did. Should we see what Michael's face down is? Face down is... Um, oh, it's a fog blade. Yep. Oh, that's a pretty good card to have right now. Negates so, I mean, effects, right? Yeah. Tom only needs to do 1,600 damage, uh, which I, I can't see a way for him to do through that fog blade. Ah. But the dolphin should have come back, to be fair. So that's just maintaining the game state there. Indeed. We see the Dante. Dante. Not Dante. 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 This mill is pretty crucial. Um, and it's Looks not quite paid off. We see the copy the of Skarm Black is good, Luster. But you don't get the monster until the end phase. Yeah, it's the end of your turn, isn't it? So Dante threatens to attack for game, but then there's the fog blade for Michael. Tom can upgrade it to a Beatrice using uh, the Libic in his hand. So it's now kind of up to Michael. Realistically, he's going to have to push through. That does not get sent to the graveyard. Michael, come on. You know that. <laughs> so Fogblade gets stuck on the board if the monster doesn't get sent to the graveyard. Gets uh, stays in it. It just stays there. And what's in Tom's hand here? Uh, he nothing. Any, so he's he's all in on the board right now. Just he with is, that I mean, most Beatrice. of his hand was discarded. <laughs> but he gets the add in the end phase. He gets the add like in the end phase for the Skarm. He's going to have a Beatrice, one Beatrice interruption. So it's kind of up to Michael to push through this Beatrice and get that damage through. Tom obviously could put could come back next turn because of the special summoning ability of the. Yeah. Um, so he's going to have Beatrice. He's going to have. A, he's probably going to have a couple of BAs because that Dante underneath the Beatrice can add extra cards to his hand. Great card, Beatrice. Fantastic card. It's one of the cards which has kept Burning Abyss relevant for so long. Its ability to send any card from your deck to the graveyard. We see that Michael's got a copy of Droll and Lockbird in his hand. That seems to be useful if... No, if it's completely useless. Oh, because it would s prevent cards being added, right? Yep. It prevents If your opponent's added a card, it prevents them adding any more. Okay. But it has to be from the deck to the hand. And when you're In a situation where your opponent's only got one card anyway, they're only going to be doing like one add, so it's, it's pretty much completely useless. So I don't not know what whether, he wanted to see. Yeah, definitely not. I don't know whether Michael's got uh, any more targets for his... Uh, any more card, any more Phantom Knight cards in his deck to use with Rusty Bardish. I don't think he does. Otherwise, he probably would have done that by now. So he summons the Silent Boots, is it? Yeah, I think the life points are also incorrect because... Michael did discard a card from his opponent's hand with the Aqua Dolphin, and that so should have done 500 damage. Yep. Yeah. And he should also be forced to trigger the Gumblar right now as well. I don't know if we should tell the judges that. Should we tell the judges? I don't know. Can we tell the judges? I'm not sure. But he should have been forced to trigger the Gumblar before, and he definitely should have been forced to trigger the Gumblar by now. I think Tom's just telling him that. I mean, he's telling him to trigger it now, but it should have triggered on the last summon. Um, and Tom's now noticed that he's summoned next to it. So Gumblar must go chaining one because uh, it's a mandatory effect. And Unicorn will go chaining two. And the card he draws for Gumblar will then get discarded. But it definitely should have triggered before. Um, so... Are they going to rewind the game at this point? How do you think the judges will handle this? Tom? I don't know if anyone's noticed that he summoned a monster next to his Gumblar before. So I don't think anyone's going to rewind the game. But there was a small error on the part of the players uh, not noticing. I mean, they have now noticed. So It looks like they're going to rebuild it if possible, the game stage. No, they're, they're not rewinding it that far. They're okay. just... They're just going to enforce the activation at this point. Yeah. I think no one's noticed that he should have activated before yet. Well, let's see what happens here then. I think this is 
not ideal for Michael because the card he draw, he's going to be forced to discard to discard a card from Tom's hand, but Tom really doesn't mind discarding a card from his hand. Uh, he's got Burning Abyss Monsters to discard. And, and they activate. And they activate when they're discarded. So They like going to the they graveyard. They like going to the graveyard, indeed. That's an absolutely awesome theme, the Burning Abyss theme. They are pretty cool. Based on the it's got a similarity of uh, the Divine Comedy, hasn't it? And uh, It's based off it, isn't yep. it? Yep. Yeah. And... Uh, they're just stunning artworks, they really are. Tells a great story. All in the artworks. I love, I love how Yu-Gi-Oh cards do that. He's I really gone do. through his whole extra deck. Like, he's used Gumba, Dweller, Phantom Knights of Rusty Wildish, One is Old, Power Tool. He's not used Nightmare Phoenix or Decode Talker. Or Nightmare Unicorn, but he's, he's done quite a lot. Um... And how how is this match progressing for both of these guys? If you were Thomas, based on the way that Michael started, it almost felt as if all the momentum was with Michael, but it feels like the game's changing. Honestly, I'm not sure that that, that game went... I, the, the turn one went ideally for Michael. Okay. I think perhaps... Could have done something slightly differently. He could have done something different, yeah. Um... I mean, I don't know for sure because I've not played with Michael's deck so much, but it looked like, given the sort of quality of start that he had, that he might have been able to do something more effective. But his deck is definitely set up differently. Like, a lot of decks like to summon a load of monsters and use the really use the firewall as the center of the plays. But okay. he, Michael's not even running firewall, so... Aha! Now uh, the judge is informing... Uh, Ollie informing me there that I've made a little mistake. So Gumblar triggers only when a monster is special summoned to a zone it's pointing. Not, not when, when it's, it's normal, normal summoned. So no one so, knows that. So the correct activation... Everything was correct. Okay. Yeah. Everything was correct except me. I was incorrect. Tom, you cannot be right absolutely all of the time. I can try. You can definitely... And you're doing very well at that, but... It happens. So, so Michael still looking to push here, but... No, he's, he's conceding. Michael's conceding. Burning Abysmal is wow. demonstrating just how sticky they are, really. They just kind of, they don't go away. You discard one. So Tom takes that game. What was the uh, logic there? Just there was no further options in his Michael extra deck? Michael basically burnt through his extra deck. Okay. He used all of it. Um, and at some point you realize Burning Abyss is just going to set up a wall of cards. They're just going to set it up again next turn. Uh, and if you can't finish them off then they're just going to keep coming back with between Seer and Dante they just keep adding the other one back to the hand you keep having to deal with it again and again and again he just put the Beatrice back into the extra deck which could have been summoned again for Tom next turn so there we have it what really went all in almost and not able to deliver the final yeah, blow I think Michael might be a little bit disappointed with how that game went because he had in a game where you've got so many options as he did. He had the soul charge. He got to look at his opponent's entire hand as well. He had perfect information. Um, I think he might be a little bit frustrated that he wasn't able to clinch that game. Uh, so, what, so what's going on now in the siding? We're seeing some copies of Cherries and some copies of Droll coming in for Tom. Tom's handwriting is substantially neater than Michael's. I approve. I can read it. Is there anything in particular there, anything else that we think might come in for Thomas? I think just a lot of hand traps, given what Michael was just trying to achieve. He might choose to rotate out the kaijus in favour of the hand traps. Yeah, he's got those two copies of Ghost Ogre as well. Yep, so we might see those, we might see the Drolls. It's kind of deceptive, a deck like Michael's and the Warrior decks in general that aren't Goki, because they add, a lot of cards go through their hand, but... None of them, are, not many of them are actually coming from the deck. So, as for whether Droll's that effective, it's hard to tell. Uh, but a lot of cards do go back and forth through the hand. They go, you know, Sword goes from the grave to the hand to the grave to the hand, and you draw cards. So, Droll's probably all right, but it's not, it's not as good as it looks at first okay. glance with the amount that's going on. Tom so very nicely showing off his side deck for us there. <laughs> so we Thanks, can see Thomas. what's going on. So yeah, we can see a lot of kaijus coming out. Again, kaijus are powerful when your opponent sets up a board and then says, come at me. 
But when your opponent's board involves discarding your hand, then the kaiju is not so helpful. I thought he was going to say, come at me, bro. Come at me, bro. Yeah. But... Unless that who, board involves a Christia. Who, who's feeling more confident now, Tom? Because Thomas... Definitely Thomas I Rose. was going to say. Yeah. He that won that game. He had no right to win that game. That was going to be my next question. Do you think that he really anticipated winning that game? I think... No. I mean, Tom had a fairly average hand. Michael had a pretty impressive hand. And it just... Tom's deck just kind of won out there. Um, so we see five so monsters again, in like, Thomas' hand. If I was Tom and I'd seen how Michael started... I would have been pretty scared, and then it just kind of all worked out. So, yeah, and then again, Michael playing the Soul Charge. I think maybe he didn't think through using the Destrudo before the Soul Charge. Severely limited what he could do with that Soul Charge because he had paid so many life points already. Normally, he'd like to Soul Charge for like four or five. Uh, and obviously, if you do that, then the Destrudo is fine because you only pay half your life points. So, half of 4,000, you only pay 2,000, that's fine. Whereas if you pay for Destrudo first, then. You run out of cards. Now uh, you run out of life points. So we look just about ready to start, and we are. Michael choosing to go second. Interesting. It's kind of interesting players now do this. They're kind of like, what's better, first or second? Uh, and shotgunning that gamma. That could really stuff up Tom's hand, actually, depending on what happens with this Suchinoko. So Suchinoko needs to draw Tom a card here, otherwise his hand is going nowhere. So if 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 Michael hits the Suchinoko, which he is not, um, so was that a good roll for that was Michael? The, that was the best, one of the best, second best roll for Tom probably. But that's really not what he wanted to see. Uh, he may just have to pass. He he can either tribute set the malicious or he can just pass. <laughs> he could tribute set the malicious and summon his dark arm dragon and then pass. <laughs> <laughs> Dark Arm Dragon. What a card, Tom. I mean, Brings not, back so many good memories for me. Not such a powerful defensive option. <laughs> but but in terms of attacking option. As an attacking option, it's pretty good. But you can't attack your opponent on the first turn. <laughs> and obviously, he's got those... So He gets this effect in the end phase, right? Yeah, so he gets the Skarm to add. Interesting choice to go for graph rather than tour guide but again I when you're leaving yourself completely defenseless <laughs> against a deck as explosive as michael's maybe that graph just gives him that little bit extra graveyard control for the dark arm maybe i don't know yeah i mean it might be that he might he's expecting to have some of his cards discarded so then having the graph in your hand is a good one to discard okay we see the is old from michael straight away yeah, I think Michael's... He's probably going to be reasonably happy. Is Tom going to tell him that he has to now add that Armageddon Knight? Well, he's already added the Armageddon Knight. I mean, what's he going to summon, do you think? Hmm. Maybe he'll just summon a Phantom Knight. Frantically looking through his deck. Lots oh, no, I see. He's going to summon a Dark Greffer because he's got Nessie in his hand. Aha. Uh -huh. Dark Griffo, again, that versatile card. I think I, I, I would have preferred to summon the the Armageddon Knight. I definitely wouldn't have locked the Armageddon Knight off the uh, off the Azold. But this in this situation, I think Tom is pretty much defenseless, so he is somewhat at Michael's mercy. And assembling 8,000 damage is, is often substantially easier than assembling a board that's completely uh, unbeatable which is what Michael had to do in the first instance, was, you know, assemble enough resources that Tom couldn't possibly come back, as opposed to just put... I mean, when I say just put 8,000 damage, I make it sound trivial, but it's, it is a substantially easier task for most decks than rip your opponent's whole hand, um, which is what Michael was trying to do in the first game, especially ripping your opponent's whole hand when he they all have hands which, uh, effects which activate when they're discarded. He just ran out of resources, right? He just yeah. couldn't quite make that final push. So we see him. Michael, set yeah, he's setting one just before he activates the Suchinoko effect, so that's a card that he particularly wants to keep. The DDR. Suchinoko's hit the Armageddon Knight, which is kind of the ideal hit because he couldn't use the Armageddon Knight anyway. And he gets to draw one for Suchinoko and summon it. Those danger cards, they really are versatile, aren't they? They we've been seeing them pop up in all sorts of decks. They are 
excellent ways of getting extra monsters on the field without using your normal summon. They also trigger effects that go in the graveyard. The only sort of the, the, the downside is you don't have that much control over what they do. So you just have to be willing to say that most of the time it will do something good. But you don't get to choose what card you discard. Yeah, so there's that lack of controlling. Yeah, and if the danger rolled. discards itself, then you don't, you know, then it has an entirely different effect as well. Which is so we can see Michael yet again building a board. I wonder if he'll play this slightly different to last time. Yeah, it will definitely be a different board because he he's only needs to attack this time. He doesn't need to take the cards out of Tom's hand. He just needs to assemble 8,000 damage through Tom's solitary zero defense point monster. And is that... It's a much, much easier task. Okay. I would and obviously he's got the attack this turn. Last time, yes. last game he went one. He went in, in game one. He went first, so he can't attack on his first. Yeah, exactly. Turn, yeah, I would be backing Michael to achieve uh, achieve this task of putting eight thousand damage on the field. So he's got the DDR. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, Tom. He's just added the divine. I don't know whether Tom is a player who is happy to pack up and or will wait until I've seen him win a couple of games via not conceding a game uh, and his opponent not playing optimally and then him being able to come back take advantage the yeah I mean and at this stage I mean this is the last round of Swiss it depends whether you value the chance that your opponent might make a mistake over the extra time in the next in the final game the next or game, the yeah. next game yes but I think it's almost that Mi Michael's almost got game on board as is um so he's got, let's see. So it's so a bit, it's, it, it's if he just activates the Phantom Knight Trap, I think, uh, he's not quite got game on board, but it's not far off. We see the copy of Instant Fusion being played there. Yeah, let's hope he doesn't try and enter his battle phase with a Thousand Eyes Restrict on the field. That would be unfortunate. Oh, he doesn't run Thousand Eyes Restrict, okay. Uh, can, we can see that Michael's also got a copy of Ash Blossom in his hand. Will that help him next turn should he not mail be able to push through for game? Uh, I mean, it would, but he is going to push for game, so. So there's the borrow sword yeah so yeah I think he now has game on board so yeah he can just attack with he seems a little bit nervous Michael yeah I think he might be a little bit upset about how the last game's gone but I, I'm pretty sure this is more than 8,000 damage on board right now and from your experience if you do if, if a game like the previous game happens as a player Tom how do you best cope with that how do you is it just switch it out of your mind and concentrate on only the next game? Yeah, or exactly. I mean, you know, dwelling on the previous game is not going to help at all. And um, it looks like they're picking up, so Michael yeah. does take that to 1-1. One, one. done his arithmetic. Yep. Lots of big monsters. They're pushing through, taking the game and bringing this match back to 1-1. One, one. So we're going to a decider. Yeah, and now we're back to see whether Tom wants to go first or second. Do you? Would, what would you do? Having that battle phase is quite important. Um, I mean, both of these decks are capable of inflicting little bits of damage without the use of the battle phase. So Tom's deck runs Barbar, uh, but the, it made a reasonably big, big impact when it was released because it was a Burning Abyss monster that actually had like a little bit of attack points, being 1,700. Not that much, but uh, it was enough for Burning Abyss players to get excited about it, but it also has that burn effect which allowed Burning Abyss to actually end some games a little bit quicker. Uh, and Michael having access to the copy of Aqua Dolphin, which does 500 burn damage, very notably in the finals of the European Championships. I was going to say, the most recent example I can think of is Luke Parks at YCS Utrecht. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, WCQ Utrecht. It wasn't in Utrecht, was it? Was um, it Berlin, Berlin, beg yeah. your pardon. And he just summons that, and the look on um, his opponent's face was... Oh, yeah. Really? So, yeah, those uh, those uh, so damage effects are really good. Yeah, because, I mean, as we saw in the first game, Michael's first turn took well, well over 10 minutes. I mean, he'll have to be aware that he can't use his own life point paying effects, such as Instant Fusion, such as Destrudo, um, if that soul is charge. his plan. Yeah, Soul Charge, etc., etc., if his plan is just to do a little bit of damage. So it does change the game plan a bit. Uh, but I'm not... I'm not sure what Tom is planning on doing, whether he's planning on going first or second. So we'll We're to about to find out. So there's the handshake. That's always good to see at this stage. 
final final, final game, game of the well, final it's, round. It's likely to be the, there's fight. A bit of the respect final game here as well. for at least one of them. Yep. Uh, and there's that mutual respect, you know. Yeah. They they've both been around a while, playing at high level. And um, let's see. I don't know who's no one's no one's told me who's started yet. No, we're not sure yet. Normally, but we are just I'm going to guess hands. it's Tom because most people point to their opponent when they're letting their opponent start. So otherwise, you would just verbally indicate that you're starting. But I don't know. Would you I pick a winner here? Uh, if I had to ask you, pick a winner here without look at looking at the hands. Without quickly, looking Tom. at the hands. No, I want to look at their hands. Okay, that's the fun bit. That's why the fun bit being in the commentary Skull boxes. Meister. That's another hand trap, right? Yes, it negates the effect of a card which activates in the graveyard. Tom's got no hand traps, so I am interested. I, it always makes me worried when the time is low and you're playing against a deck like Michael's, which can more than happily take 10 minutes on its first turn to put yourself in a situation where you don't have a turn. That feels worrying. He does to have Sucker's Light, so he's going to draw additional cards. If he gets a turn. If he gets it. a turn. Yeah. Um, yeah, it always Are we saying that this is probably a, a long turn like we saw in the game one? Yeah, he's got that Summoner Monk. Uh, but he does, he's not running Firewall to reuse Summoner Monk in the way that I was suggesting yep. previously. But he has got the copy of DDR. He's not going to have access to Destrudo this game. Um, because if he does, it, it, Destrudo it's is too many to life cost points. in the game, yeah. right? So I think he's just going to have to... I think he's probably just going to go for the... He's uh, old. Yeah, he's obviously going to go no, for the Azold. No, the is just such a good card. Oh, yeah. I mean, accessing, like, Warrior is one of the most supported types of monsters, and being able to access any Warrior from your deck with its second effect is incredibly powerful. Yeah, and I mean, Summon Noble Knights, out. there were some new cards in the Soul Fusion set as well, which I'm quite a fan of the Warriors. I'm quite a fan of the story that the Noble Knights mm. tell. And I'm not sure if you've seen it, Tom, but did you see the audio of a Traveller game, Matt, this year? So for those attending our YCS events over a long period of time for this, throughout this year and uh, attending X amount of events, they can obtain it as an additional prize. Have you seen it? It's, uh, it's old. got as old, yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember when the Ordeal of a Traveller was Dante. Didn't it actually get you the Ordeal of a Traveller card? No. Well, what, what was the card called? The, the one that summoned a load of Burning Abyss monsters from the graveyard. Was it like Ordeal of the Burning Abyss or something? I am not sure, but I think I do remember it now that you say it. Um, it did see some play at some point. Those Burning Abyss cards were really popular back in the day. They were... <laughs> I mean, I seem to remember a whole bunch of the European play, uh, European Championship top card playing that deck. Yep. Um, so resourceful, so, so many options, so versatile. And now we're seeing Burning Abyss against Phantom Knights. They've uh, switched allegiances. They, they have. used to work together. But and not the Phantom anymore. Knights have dropped off and gone to this dark warrior. They've gone over to Michael. the dark side, yeah. <laughs> that, you had to get that in. <laughs> Indeed. So, Michael, I think we're going to see the Phantom Knights of Rusty Bardish come down again. We saw that in the game one, right? That's not a oh, Phantom that's Knights Deco of Rusty Talker. Bardish. That's interesting. I don't know why. I also don't know why he hasn't sent Sword yet. Oh, because Sword's already in his graveyard. That's why he hasn't sent Sword yet. That makes sense. I was going to say, he probably wants to get the Sword in his graveyard somehow. Deco Talker does have more attack points than the Phantom Knights of Rusty Bardish. But I feel like the Phantom Knights monster offers more options. Have we seen Michael activate the Neospatian effect yet? I don't no, think we I have. think we're about to see him do it now. Okay. So if you have the luxury of doing so, which he does, you might as well wait until you have a monster with more attack points on the field, because Aqua Dolphin can destroy an opponent's card with less attack than a monster you control. So he's just waited until he's got a bigger monster. So that um, Phantom Knight's... Uh, that Deco Talker is up to 2,800 attacks, so he's now and got the choice of discarding any card in his opponent's hand. And is, and is there a clear choice among those targets? Uh, I mean, definitely not the malicious. Okay. Yeah, because <laughs> that is uh, that such a good in card graveyard. in the graveyard, yes. So he's chosen to discard the Alec in this case, which can negate the effect of a uh, monster that Michael controls, but he's, he's already used the effects of all the monsters on his field for now, so I don't think that that's going to bother him at all, which is why he was happy to choose it. So Michael just continuing to build this field, Indeed. starting to look good. It is starting to look good for Michael. So, we, yeah, you've got the DDR again. DDR seems like a really cool card. So I think it was... Discarding those Phantom Knights as well. It was included in the deck initially just as a way of um, having enough equip spells to trigger Azold. But I think it's actually such a cool card 
just to play if you draw it anyway. So people just initially were just looking for the least bad equip spells to put in their deck. But now they're like, hey, actually, this card's really cool. Uh, I'm just going to play it at three because I want to draw it. <laughs> so that's pretty cool to see. Uh, so here we see the he, he, can, he can afford to pay for Zephros. He's done 500 damage to his opponent. So he can pay the 400 life points. And still be on more life and points. And still be on more life points. Um, so, yeah. I'm not really sure where he's going with this, to be honest. But I think he might just be trying to make plays which last a sufficiently long time uh, to keep ahead of the game. So there we see the Zephros. Zephros bouncing the... Presumably the DDR, yeah. And then he can banish the Armageddon Knight once more for the Divine Sword Phoenix Blade. And then he can dis and then discard he can summon it again. Discard the Phoenix Blade, summon the Zephros. Uh, summon the Armageddon Knight. Armageddon Knight for the... Third time? I don't know how many times he's summoned it quite now. Quite a lot of times. Quite a lot of times. It's quite a good card, is Armageddon Knight. Yeah, I any dark monster from I remember, your deck to the graveyard. I'm not sure if I played you, but I remember running a traditional tournament where you could play um, some forbidden cards in your uh, deck, obviously. And send that Makiura. Yes, you do remember it. And I used to play that Armageddon. I send Makiura. You sound like fun, you know. <laughs> and then just draw Exodia <laughs> from my deck. At the traditional tournament, Dom was the one sending. <laughs> <laughs> playing Makiura FTK. What, what's wrong with that, Tom? <laughs> well, I mean, I like drawing cards, and I like everyone drawing, likes them drawing playing cards. trap cards. That is true. I mean, the Armageddon. The you can in the US with Summon Sorceress, normal Summon Armageddon Knight, and assemble an FTK just with the normal Summon of an Armageddon Knight. <laughs> At Seems the pretty impressive to me. <laughs> Armageddon Knight is that good a card. So we see Michael just. Assembling more to the field. So he is getting the Phantom Knight's Link Monster out now. Yep, we did see that game one. Uh, he knows that he can successfully hit if he uses the effect of um, Dolphin again to do another 500 damage for what it's worth and pick out another card from his opponent's hand. Yeah, I think he's, he's got the option opportunity to make Levier, yep. uh, which is quite cool. He can then summon back that. Summon back Armageddon Knight for the... However many times, I don't know how many times it is now. It's a lot of times. There's a lot of cards banished from Michael as well. Yeah, that's what the sword does. Yep. If only, if only there was a dimension fusion, huh? What a card. What a card. Absolute. Michael does seem a bit nervous here. He His does. hands are shaking. He does. I mean, I mean, he knows that he can... I c I, and I think you know more than most people. It means a lot to, to them. At this stage, they're in yeah. the final... They're in, they're in the crunch time. This is crunch time. It's 1-1. One, one. They win this game. They go. They pro they progress to the top cut. Yeah. So, you know... I mean, Michael just having a discussion with... He's trying to discard the Gadala, and Tom's saying, you don't have a monster with enough attack points. I thought Tom negated the um, a different card with Alec, but Tom indicating that he might have negated Decode Talker with Alec. So maybe they're just trying to remember what was negated with Alec. Because if the Decode Talker's effect is negated, his attack is only 2,300, so he has to discard the Malicious. Which is good for Tom. Which is, I mean, again, at this point, it doesn't really matter. I don't think he's going to get a turn. Um, but, yeah. I, if he discards the Malicious, it does 500 damage. As long as somehow Michael doesn't end up taking 500 damage, <laughs> I think he's not going to be too fussed. Um, I, I mean, obviously, we didn't hear what the players said. It looked nope. to me like They're just discussing it Tom at the table pointed now. to the Aqua Dolphin when he used the effect of Alec. It, but I... I I can't, uh, he might have been, you know, the, they are in the same column, so it might not have been obvious. Um, so, obviously, Michael is trying to say that he thought he pointed to the uh, aqua, uh, aqua Dolphin, or maybe he just forgot that he pointed to the Deco Talker, I don't know. But the players are just discussing now. Um, yep, I think they're both what just what? talking to the judges, giving them their it side of the story. Even though we have the video footage, there's no real way to confirm. From I mean, from my perspective, it wasn't entirely clear because I didn't hear what Tom said. I just saw his hand wave, and it looked like he was pointing to the Aqua Dolphin, but he may very well have had his hand over the decode talker, and it's just the overhand thing because they're in the same column. Yep, but 
as mentioned, they're still discussing, they're they still, still reviewing discussing this it. situation. Honestly, I don't think in this situation it really matters. I think Michael's turn is very likely to take the remaining 30 seconds and Tom's not going to get a battle phase in his next turn. Um. So, yeah. I mean, and obviously at this stage, at this crunch time, it's just making the players a little bit more uneasy. You can Tom seems to be dealing with the pressure a little bit more, but Michael's a little bit more visibly um, emotional about it. Tom um, did say he had a, a facade of calm. He and did. He wasn't calm. And it serves him well, he said, yes. But Whereas Michael, on the other hand, is, uh, I don't know, being a bit more expressive. Well, they're in good hands. The judges and the uh, staff are definitely the people to make sure that the correct decision is and made. Hopefully nothing should get past the uh, two table judges and the video Indeed, footage. Indeed, yeah. So they're just talking about that, it still seems. Okay, so they're, they're appealing. We're be yes, we're being informed that the head judge is being asked to review the situation. So we are with the, with the head judge at this point, waiting on the decision to be made. I'm interested, yeah, so I think maybe the appeal is what the target was with Alec, yeah. Um, so, I mean. Yeah, again. Yeah, it's a bit of a, it's a strange one because basically I think maybe Michael's saying, well, I didn't think that you targeted this and therefore, you know, there was a miscommunication between the players. So the question then becomes, should Michael be forced to make the same plays that he did, given he thought that Tom had done something else? Yep. Uh, so that might be a bit of a hard line by the head judge to say, like, well, you know, you've done this. This was this was what happened, and this is what you've done, and you can't take back what you've done. Yep. So and whether I you think a miscommunication between the players is sufficient grounds for one of the players to go back on what they did before. What do you think? What Do you, do you think someone should be able to go back? From my experience, you need to... I mean, and this is where there are always two sides of the story. We need to review all of the information provided by the players to the judges. That needs to be relayed now in this instance to the head judge. It's a difficult situation. And I yeah, mean, I, I think my days of making those decisions, Tom, are long <laughs> gone. Uh, as I say, it is a lot of, um, it is a lot of uh, responsibility that the head judge takes on. And yeah, I think ultimately, that decision is made. Oh, so apparently Fauna, should we have a look at the text of um, Aquadolphin? Yeah, let's bring that up. No, we need to bring it up for you guys, not for me. Well, we need to bring it up for both people. Do I click it once? So. So yeah. So I uh, yeah. So Aquadolphin, it seems he tried to discard the Gadala. I'm not actually sure how Aquadolphin works. I thought it just. Can you can you bring up the Aquadolphin for us? What do you pick? That this you know for the for the people at home. Okay, we're struggling to bring it up for you at home. But essentially, once per turn, you can discard one card. Look at your uh, opponent's hand. I see. So you do actually have to monster. choose the monster with Aquadolphin. And so he chose a monster that had less attack than one of the monsters on his field because uh, his Deco Talker was negated. So I thought they were discussing whether the Deco Talker was negated or not, but there seems to be some confusion as that. to. Okay. So now they're just checking that. So Michael pointed to the Gadala despite the fact he didn't have a monster with enough attack points on the field to discard the Gadala. Um, so that means Michael's going to take the 500 damage, which is not really what Michael wants to happen. Well, it means that Michael might, depending on how the appeal of the judge goes, that Michael takes 500 damage. So now he's going to have to look through his extra deck and figure out if there's a way for him to do 500 damage back. Uh, which I'm not sure that there is given that there's only 20 seconds left. And Tom's drawn Gallus to do more yep, damage he's anyway. That Seca, he's got the additional draws. Gallus going to do an extra 1400 burn damage. Um. So we can hear the, the crowd is really excited about that extra burn damage from Gallus right yeah. now. So 
effectively Tom is just hitting home with that additional burn damage and he was up on life points anyway yeah so he's just hitting home the reinforcing too. the point that actually no at the end of this match Thomas Rose takes it with the additional life points so bit of an unfortunate position for Michael he he kind of was in a position where he felt he was in control but Thomas with the draw off of the of the seconds light had the Gallus anyway let's talk about that a little bit more in the post match analysis so there we have it unbelievable finish to that match Thomas Rose summoning the that Gallus was one of the tensest matches we've seen I mean I think like the Gallus was neither here nor there I think it was the fact that yeah, I think if Michael had chose he because he chose a card a wrong card uh dolphin does damage to you yep so that means he was below on life points at the start of tom's turn and then tom activates the seconds light and i mean it doesn't really matter tom's it turn is going to take 30 home. seconds so yeah from tom's point of view he felt like he was still in a position to win the match anyway i mean michael would have just won the match outright if he just hadn't made that small mistake a very easy mistake to make to forget that the deco talker's effect to gain attack points was being negated and yep. therefore he couldn't he didn't have a monster with more attack than the gadala so just recapping here definitely the first game was a bit of an odd one michael seemed to be in the most advantageous position he had all of the pieces he was summoning everything to the field but he then had he just so many ran out options. of steam. Yeah. He just ran out of steam. The Burning Abyss deck really showing just how annoying it can be once it starts to get going. You know, once it, it sets up the Beatrice, and then if the Beatrice dies magically, a Dante appears, and then if the, da you know, if the Dante dies, it gets the Seer back, which gets the Dante back again. It's just, it can be a real sort of tar pit to get through, uh, which is what it showed in the first game. And then obviously, in game two, he manages to assemble that board, similar to what we saw in game one, pushing through, taking the game, and, and going to game three. But that match, seriously, the crowd, when they see the Gallus, it was a phenomenal, yeah, that was phenomenal reception to that card being displayed. I love Gallus. <laughs> so there we have it. Thomas Rose is your winner for round 11. That is the end of Swiss. The next time you'll be seeing us is in the top cut. I'm going to head over to the feature match area. Oliver German is standing by with our match winner, Thomas Rose. Over to you, Oli. Yeah, guys, welcome back to the feature match table. The crowd just went a little bit wild. I think most of them were in shock after that feature match, so they then took flight. We still have a couple of people here who were, seem to be rooting for you, Tom. Um, what's the reason? Why are you such a guy that wins over the crowd so easily? I guess like there's a bit of a story. Like I always play the deck that people know me for. It builds a character, and it's, it's just fun. I, like, I keep coming back, and I keep uh, just finding a new way to make this deck do something. I, and apparently the socks. The socks help, yeah, the socks definitely help. So run us through it. To me, it seemed almost like you were sitting there letting your opponent play for 40 minutes and suddenly he lost and you had like four moves. Can you break it down a little bit further for the guys at home? Uh, that's about it, really. Oh. Uh, the, the game three got very strange. I didn't quite understand the ruling with um, the Aqua Dolphin. I thought that he was forced to choose something with lower attack than he had. So after he chose the Kaiju, I said, no, no, you can't choose the Kaiju. But the, the judges knew more than me, and after he'd chosen that card, he was then forced to have that as his choice, yeah. and he took the damage. We had like 30 seconds left on the clock, and yeah. at that point, he was below me on life points, and it got, got pretty weird. So, yeah, exactly. It got pretty weird. So how does that feel? You're sitting there, and in a way, you're not really doing anything. Like he, He's making all the moves, he's making all the decisions, and in the end, he makes a decision that costs him the game. Um, what is happening in your head in that situation? Uh, well, I... I kind of actually set him up for it earlier in the turn when I used the Alec effect because obviously I'm not going to target anything on his board for the rest of the turn so I don't have to use Alec but I figure I may as well use it on the Deco Talker just in case he needs the attack points later uh, in case he wants to in case I was thinking if he tried to use the uh, Dolphin three times but as it was the second time was enough because he just hadn't realized that his Deco Talker only had 2300 attack. Is this something I mean, you're notorious for uh, playtesting a lot, obviously. You always find the perfect Burning Abyss build for every tournament. Um, is this a situation that you can like test ahead of the tournament? I tested a lot for beating Sky Striker because I thought they were going to be the most represented deck, and they were, and I haven't played any. Okay. We've heard from other players that they played like eight rounds of Sky Striker mirrors yesterday. I so, we your, your wish. Okay, I get it. Um, so, obviously, you found the new take on Burning Abyss. 
Is it a deck, because I think there's a difference between building a deck that gets you into the top 32 and another deck that gets you maybe into the top 32, but once you're in there, you're bound to win the tournament. What kind of approach did you take this weekend? Um, I was aiming, well, I, I just assumed that there would be a lot of Sky Strikers all the way through and maybe Thunder Dragons, um, but largely I just chose the deck because it's the only one I know how to play. <laughs> Okay, well, sometimes that it all comes down to this, yeah. All right, so now you're locked up for the top 32. What's going to be your expectation for the rest of the day? I'll probably find some guy playing FDK and I'll lose. Okay, so you're not too hopeful. Uh, what's the approach? Are you taking it one match at a time or are you going to be like, okay, I'm, I'm aiming for top eight and then I'm going to re like set my sights? Uh, I guess making the top 32 is nice. I, I get a top cut play mat, it's always fun. Uh, at this point, I really want one of those prize cards. I play a lot of cube draft, and it's a really good card for cube, so I want to win one so that I can use that. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Best of luck in the top 32. As always, we would love to have you here, either on that table or on this table this weekend. I guess it's going to be this table. And I guess you won't mind too much either. All right, guys, with that, we're um, done with the Swiss portion of the tournament. That means now we're going to have final standings after Swiss. Uh, those are going to be put up and the players have uh, five to ten minutes to review those results. So they can make sure that they got that win in that 11th round, for example, or that all of the past results are correctly entered into the scorekeeper's laptop. Once everybody agreed on the standings after Swiss, we can then move on with the top 32 cut. So there might be a bit of a longer break now when you compare the breaks on the second day, which are non-existent for the most part. And uh, then we're going to be back with our top 32 feature match. So don't go anywhere or maybe like grab a snack and then you come back. And we're going to be right back with our top 32 feature match for YC's London 2018.